Hello everyone and welcome to a new let's play of Hearts of Iron 4 The Great War Austria Hungary. Yes, we are starting a new let's play and this time we are going to play one of the big boys. And as usual, fair warning, this is the first episode, meaning I'm gonna spend it uh, setting things up, speaking about the historical background, our strategy for the upcoming episodes, and our long-term goals that we plan to achieve within this playthrough. So if that's not something that you guys enjoy, I recommend you jump to episode number two, but as before, this game is all about context, and without that context, you might be a bit lost in the next few dozen episodes, hopefully. <laughs> no, hopefully you won't be lost, but you can be. <laughs> anyway, let's start this. We are going to play a new game starting 1st of May 1910, the powder kick of Europe. 1910 is a challenging time for the peace in Europe. The Italians are preparing for a war with the Ottomans, which will threaten their hold in the Balkans. Rebellion in Morocco is beginning to boil over, much to the anguish of France and to the delight of the German Empire. All in all, either clear heads will be needed to keep the peace, or strong hearts to win the war. So this is our scenario. And we are going to play Austria-Hungary. Now, the reason why I am starting here and not on the map is that I want you to hear the brief history description because it speaks about a couple of points that I want to make. So, Austria-Hungary is led by Franz Joseph I. He's an authoritarian um, governor or ruler. Government is an authoritarian regime, we know that. Elections will be in May 1911 and the ruling party is authoritarian. Brief history of Austria-Hungary. The last century, the last century was a curse to the Austrian throne. Humiliation after humiliation was thrust upon her, from the rampage of Napoleon to the unification of Germany by the Prussians. A venerable old Kaiser Franz Joseph I now stands as the weakest member of the Triple Alliance with two of her old enemies. But surprisingly, this has gone well for Austria so far. The Habsburgs have inherited Bosnia, and the people of Hungary finally seems placated. Perhaps more good shall come. We have a couple of um, modifiers here. House of Habsburg Lorraine gives us extra daily political power gain. Not much, but 0 0.05. The House of Habsburg Lorraine is one of the most influential royal houses of Europe, and the ruling dynasty of Austria-Hungary. The long legacy of this family on the throne of the empire gives them much of the necessary legitimacy to maintain their rule so long as they can maintain it. Multinational state, however, gives us a lowered stability by 10%. Unlike most countries of this period, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is not a nas nationalistically organized state, but instead a relic of old marriages and throne inheritances Inheritances. Yeah, I'm saying it correctly, I think. Inherit inheritances. Ah, my apology. Which have given the empire a cultural patchwork of territories. In recent times, many of the subject nationalities of the empire have begun a push for independence, hurting the Austrian state. And then there is a couple of uh, bigger things here uh, to read. Securing Italian loyalty. The Italians are, to say the least, not exactly on the friendliest terms with us. We should start negotiating with them in order to establish more amicable relations if we hope to keep them in our alliance. Of course, if we go through with this, we'll probably end up losing territory. Then we have the military expertise from Germany. They say that Prussia was hatched from a cannonball, and while they may not call the country that anymore, the axiom still holds true. Accepting the help of Germany to modernize our military would be an easy benefit to reap from this alliance. And from Kaiserlich und Königlich Luftfahrttruppen. The new aeroplanes are interesting toys and perhaps hold some military value. Civilian pilots could 
easily be attracted to our military. Experts could teach us how to use these uh, newfangled contraptions, and if this project bears fruit, we may earn ourselves a decisive advantage over our opponents who fall behind in this field, particularly in the doctrines of these aircraft. So, these are the descriptions that the game gives us. But there is a lot to say about Austria-Hungary in this period. Now, I'm going to do a general description of the situation. Austria is here. Uh, I'm going to, as always, link Wikipedia pages below for those of you that are interested. But there is quite a lot to say. The reason why I will try to be brief here is that many of you know I live in Prague, uh, I'm Czech, and thus during my high school and university studies a lot of time uh, was dedicated to the history of Austria-Hungary. Uh, the kings of Austria-Hungary ruled over uh, the territory of Czech Republic for, num for hundreds of years basically. and. Uh, the time during this, say, era or epoch or whatever you want to call it, was one of the most frustrating for uh, Czechs. It is worth saying that Austria-Hungary in 1910 was uh, not that far away from Ottoman Empire. It was a multinational state where you had Czechs, Slovaks, Hungarian, Austrians, Germans, you had Croats, Slovenes, uh, you had Romanians, uh, Gypsies, uh, Russians, Polish people. There were so many uh, ethnicities in uh, the empire and all of them demanded their own rights. Now what happened though is that many of these were silenced, others were suppressed and um, in the year 1967, where actually the monarchy became uh, something that is known as dual monarchy, meaning that Franz Josef was um, uh, the Kaiser of uh, one part and a king of another part, meaning that it was Austria, where he was um, the Kaiser, and king of Hungary. This has happened in 1867, and it was only one way the history could go. Uh, there was actually quite a bit of a move for either pluralization, uh, complete pluralization, or um, more like uh, becoming sort of a federation of states, where Czechs, Slovaks, Hungarians, and all of these other nations would be uh, on the same level, you know, and they would have the same rights. Or there was a move for um, not becoming a dual state, but sort of a tri-state of Hungarians, Austrians and Czechs. This, however, didn't happen and the Czech national movement uh, was suppressed in that way, which led to a lot of frustration in my country at that time. Now, what this also meant was that Kaiser uh, Franz Joseph I was not interested in any modernization of the country. Uh, they didn't speak a lot about this, but the fact is that uh, Austria-Hungary was desperately uh, in the need of military, political, industrial, economical reforms. And while there was a quite a huge uh, bureaucracy that was trying to push this there was a lot of resistance in the upper levels of the government, meaning Kaiser and um, his um, you know, ministers and uh, advisors, because they all feared, or mostly, not I cannot say all, but most of them feared that any change would put the country or the empire into such an imbalance that could lead to it falling apart. Now, kind of an interesting uh, thing is that when... Um, Franz Joseph the first died, and his uh, successor Karl uh, came uh, to power. He reached out to the various nationalities, including the Czechs and uh, you know um, Hungarians and Croats, and he he offered that if they would stay in the monarchy, there would be some sort of federalization of the empire. But these requirements in 1917 were rejected by the nations that were desperate for them just a couple of years earlier. That alone should show you how the mood in the country changed within those years and how many people uh, actually hoped that uh, Austria-Hungary would lose and fracture as it did. And then you saw all of these smaller states 
coming from Austria Hungary. So that's um, that's the general uh, introduction. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna skip into the game. Uh, I'm gonna investigate the things that are there. I'm gonna prepare our empire for the way that I want to go. And then once in there, we are going to go through it. I'm gonna start recording, explaining everything. And that's gonna be the rest of this episode. And as usual, in episode two, we are going to start playing. So I'll see you with the beautiful Austrian Hungary Empire in just a few seconds. Welcome, welcome one and all to Austria Hungary on the date of 1st of May 1910. So I spent quite a lot of time going through everything, sorting out stuff, and now I would like to walk you through it and explain what I did, why I did it, what we want to do with it, and where we're heading. The usual stuff, you know. So let's start uh, with uh, the policies and political stuff. So you all know this guy, Franz Joseph I, is our Kaiser, the man himself. We are looking at a prevalent authoritarian uh, government, which is fine by me. I don't think we need to go to fascist uh, at all. We're just going to stick to authoritarian. Hopefully it's not going to drop uh, too far. I checked, but we have no occupied territories. All of these are our cores, which is good. But as I mentioned, you can see that we are occupying quite a lot of uh, nations here, which... Um, while being our course, uh, still require us to keep them in mind. We are at limited conscription, which is good. Uh, not starting with the volunteers only, so I'm happy with that. Our recruitable population is at 2.5%, and it won't be very hard for us to go to extensive conscription eventually. Service by requirement is also something that we might want to go to, uh, which would give us... Well, four times more people than we have right now, which is pretty good, so I like that. I don't think that we will ever go to all adults, sir, but it's, you know, we'll see, we'll see. We have an export uh, focus on our economy, which is fine at this point, because it gives us a bonus to construction speed, to research speed, to factory output, dockyard output, and it takes 50% uh, of our resources to market, which is fine, you know, I kind of like this one. Uh, going with limited exports eventually might be something that we might want to go with, but uh, not at this point. I'm kind of surprised though that we have partial mobilization already. Um, when we started with Sweden, I believe we had civilian economy, so this is a great thing to see, uh, giving us a lot of uh, extra uh, you know, factories and um, Military construction, uh, military factory construction speed bonus of 10%. Now we started with 150 political power, so I used that one to get us our first advisor, Gabor Ugron. Now Gabor here gives us a stability bonus of 15%, which is amazing, because when you look at that, we have 87 now with Gabor. Without him, we had 72. So that's a big boost to our political power gain, to the factory output. Dockyard output lowers the consumer goods that we need in our factories. Generally speaking, uh, I think he's great. Now, I identified two more that we will want to get. One of them is called uh, Eugene Hordlicka, I think um, is the pronunciation, or Elgen Hordlicka, depending on where he is from, who is going to give us a bonus construction speed for military uh, factories, dockyards, and fuel silos. And the next one is Agenor Golukhovsky, who will give us extra 15% political power gain. Now, there are also a couple of others that I think will be useful later on. Uh, Alois Lexa von Arenthal gives us non-core manpower 2%, which is great, and lowers damages to garrison. So if you occupy a large territories, he might be good uh, to get. Switch him, for example, with... Um, well, I guess Elgen would be the first one to go. And there is also Adolf Hafner, um, who will give us extra operatives and agency upgrade time lowered by 15%. So that might also be good to keep in mind. 
Other than that, we have a number of advisors that we can get. Uh, we have August here who gives us ARM experience. Um, we want that. We have two guys both giving us uh, here as chief of armies additional army experience of 0 0.06 daily together with our theorist that's uh, 0.11 per day, which is decent. And we can either choose division defense plus 5% or extra 8% entrenchment. I think that we're going to go with the division defense here that uh, is a bit more uh, general. Uh, we have a couple of Chiefs of Navy here, one of them actually giving us 0.12 daily naval experience, so I'm going to go with him. And we have a guy that can also help us with uh, air. Pretty, pretty nice. And we get a couple of uh, military high commanders here who give uh, additional experience and various bonuses that we will have to... Um, eventually see. I know that we, one of them, that of those that we are going to take is Blasius Shemwa, who will lower attrition by 4%. And I think we might go with Anton House, who gives uh, capital ship attack and armor of extra 5%. And the last one should be probably someone from Air. But I don't think we have one. All of these are naval uh naval and uh, military okay so so that's that's that as far as our national focuses go jesus christ do we have a ton to go through and uh it's it's a mess uh, it's a mess there are many branching paths that we will have to choose from so we already have which kind of uh wasn't a surprise to me diplomatic effort uh, which i believe is where our political power came from the 150 it has no description unfortunately uh we have the lands um Landstreitkräfte Österreich Ungarns. Austria Hungary's army is actually split into three jurisdictions an Austrian force, a Hungarian force, and a joint unified force, all of which operate with their own officers and staff. Modernization of such a force is a tall order, but possible, and will inevitably lead to a more effective armed force. So, this political. Um, Focus gave us extra 15 uh, arm experience, which you can see here, and we get a 20% cost reduction for a land doctrine. And we also have industrial effort one, which gave us a 15% research bonus for industry. And we have the reinforce uh, KUK. I'm not sure how to pronounce this uh, in during this playthrough. I think I'm going to stick with KUK. It's Kaiserlich und Königlich, which means Kaisers and Kings. Uh, it's a general thing that was used in Austria-Hungary, Kriegsmarine. So if you hear me say KUK, it's uh, Kaiserlich und Königsrecht, but I don't want to pronounce it all the time. I think it would be a bit... well, we'll see, we'll see. So, though Austria hasn't been landlocked since 14th century, our empire has never boasted a particularly fearsome navy. However, it is better late than never. A large modernization program to back our construction of brand new ships will hopefully give us a naval force capable of competing in a harsh Mediterranean sea. This is a lie. Not only don't we have the naval experience 25, but we don't even have the dockyards. Uh, when you check, we have two. So the game is lying to us. And for some reason, this one doesn't kick in. So... Yeah, we don't have this one, just so you know. So what I started with here is the political effort, which will take 70 days and is going to give us 120 political power. After that, we are going to go with reinforcing Emperor's authority, which will give us additional 100 political power. And then we are going to switch into the Balkans policy, extra 75 political power, and we're going to annex uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. By the time, I think, we should be able to get the infrastructure effort and the first level of um, industrial boost. Not many of these are that interesting for us, but the one that I'm definitely interested in is the dockyard expansion, because it's going to more than double our current naval dockyard, so we'll need this as soon as possible. So let, uh, let me quickly check this. This is uh, 70 days, so let's call it two months, four months. Uh, so that means June, July, August, September. Then you're 21 days, so let's call that uh, October. Then it's 14 days, so that's November. 
you will be seven days, so that's January. Yeah, we'll be able to just about get that. And once we are done with the dockyard expansion, I think we're gonna go with the elements effort, then the construction effort, and we're gonna switch back to other things. I think we will need to be a bit more mindful of the things that we want here because there is a lot of options here. I mean, getting, for example, the uh, Wuftfar Truppen um, is a good idea because it's going to give us reduction for ad doctrine, a lot of our experience. Um, these equipment efforts also give arm experience, which is amazing, and we would like to get those. Um, these give all bonuses to uh, naval research, uh, but the dockyard expansion is the one that I'm interested in the most, and I'm going to explain why in just a second. So I think this is uh, what we can say about the political effort. And now let's look a bit more on our economy. So what I'm really happy with is the fact that we get pretty much everything. We even have a decent oil extraction. Uh, we have actually 63 oil. 18 is here. Uh, we got 32 up here, which we need to protect, so we'll need to make sure that this area is not lost to Russia. And there was another source somewhere. Transdanube. Ah, here. Okay, so 18 here, 13 here. So this alone will make us capable of uh, building a force of cars, tanks, uh, and navy that we can supply. But we'll need to develop this and make sure that we get as much as possible. So getting the extraction here is going to be extremely important. Uh, we also have a ton of aluminum, uh, tungsten, steel, chromium, coal and wood. Where we lack is rubber and I already started imports from Brazil. So getting some synthetic refineries sooner than later will also be pretty important for us because uh, if you remember all of the... Here's research, I'm gonna speak about it later on. Uh, but all of the cars... Re oh, actually these cars... Oh wow, car these cars don't require rubber at all. Kind of surprised. None of you? None of you, really? Thanks. Okay, tanks don't require that either. So is it really just the vehicles? Yeah. Uh, okay, but you know, anyway, we need it for horse-drawn vehicles, which are needed for everything, pretty much. Uh, and once we switch to urban motorized, we'll need it even more. So uh, as we are going to grow our production of cars, uh, this will be important. But again, this, um, this puts it in a bit more of a perspective where the research will eventually give us... Um, uh, okay, just realize, yeah, we will never be able to upgrade it in this uh, playthrough. Okay, so just building the synthetic refine. On the other hand, can we import it from... Well, we can import from Belgium, and eventually that's gonna fall to Germany, so maybe we'll be able to import it just from Germany. For now, I'm importing it from Brazil. Eh, maybe we don't need that. Okay, uh, I also set a grandiose plan of construction here. Considering our army will require quite a lot of modernization, um, I scheduled a huge number of uh, tasks for it. We are starting with measly 37 civilian industries and uh, 12 military factories compared to, for example, Germany who has 60 and 23. So we have about half of what they do. But, you know, still it's not bad. It's, um, you know, it's uh, slightly less than Russia has. And on par with France. Okay, gotcha. So we're not doing all that bad, but it's, it's you know, still not exactly great. So we're starting with uh, boosting some of our construction capacities by always building two civilian factories. By the way, it's great that we can hold two lines right off the bat. And I think that once I unpause the game, we are going to start exporting tons and tons of uh, resources. So this should go up uh, significantly as well. So we're starting with some civilian factories, then we're gonna build a military factory, then again a civilian factory. We're gonna soon start working in Dalmatia on um, 
naval dockyard because we need more of those. Uh, then again, civilian factories, military, and you can see how you know the pattern goes. Right about here, uh, I think I, this should be mid 1911. We're gonna build a bigger boost to our military factories because we will need to start producing some new stuff and airplanes and stuff like that. So at that point, I'm gonna start switching it to one to one. But we'll see how it's gonna go. So far, I want to boost the civilian uh, production as well. What I see as problematic is our railway is fairly weak, and especially in the areas uh, of the borders with uh, Russia, we do not really have uh, much capacity here. So I think it might be necessary for us to build some supply hubs here to make sure that our units will be able to get proper uh, supplies and defend against uh, the enemies. On the other hand, the good, good news is that the opponent um, has a railway here that we can follow and thus make sure our units will be in supply later on as well. So that's, uh, that's important. Now, uh, I mentioned that the uh, construction is going to go like this. Uh, we have the trade so I think this is all for economy. So let's now move to research and general plans for the army. So let's start by research. Research is gonna be a quick one. Uh, we basically set all of our research on uh, boosts to economy, you know, as, as you do in the beginning. Uh, we got mechanical computing that's gonna increase our research speed by 1%. We got carpentry schools, extra production efficiency cap of 1%. Construction 1, which is going to help with construction speed by 2%. And we have oil extraction, which will allow us to get some fuel silos, but also fuel gain per oil of 10 extra percent and fuel gain from refineries extra 10 percent. So again, this one is going to be very important for us. Now we're going to focus on civilian industry in the beginning very heavily. Um, we are going to switch to heavy industry once we're done with carpentry schools and uh, metallurgy schools, which will give us additional 2% production efficiency and 10% factory output. Uh, we will also go with underground mining, extra resource gain efficiency and improved oil drilling. And here we get trench excavation. Not really sure about the trenches, uh, but we'll need to finish these as soon as possible. As far as engineering goes, uh, we're working on the research speed. Uh, we're going to get the basic radios as well and communication systems plus the encryption and decryption. But what we need to get as soon as possible is also the tank prototype. Uh, we neglected this during our Swedish playthrough because we didn't think that we had what it took. But the, here we absolutely, 100% need to get tanks as fast as possible without any doubt. This is something that will be absolutely... Um, necessary for us and I, I cannot stress that enough. Uh, the reason why we're going to be focusing on industry and engineering in the beginning is that we are pretty good as far as equipment goes. We got all of the 1910 uh, technology with the exception of marines and I don't think we need those. Uh, the first level of upgrades is going to come in 1914. As far as the support companies go there is the same situation. The only one that we're missing is the signal company which requires us to get uh, radio, so we will, uh, and start using these as well. Civilian trains and everything are way in the future, so no need to do anything here. Uh, the first military one that we might get eventually is our armored car. Now we're using the Austro Daimler, and here is the Univich PA-1. So you can see that uh, the upgrade gives us a bit more of a defense. Uh, hardness is 70%, hard attack is still 2, but armor goes up and breakthrough goes up. Soft attack is the same, speed goes up, piercing increases. Fuel usage uh, stays the same and production cost goes up. Now this will be something that I will talk about once we get to the military part of explanation. But yeah, that's that. Artillery-wise, uh, we are doing fine. These are all just um, upgrades to performance, so there is not that much uh, needed here. Navy, on the other hand, is something that we will need to focus on heavily. Uh, we do not have quite that many uh, 
technologies researched here and you know it's better than we were doing as Sweden but we still get a ton of things to do here. Unfortunately what's gonna be our bottleneck will be not the technology but the production capability so you know keep that in mind. Air, not much to say, we got the scouts so that is something that I am happy with. We also got the airship but until 19, uh, 1915 we won't be able to get um, you know any other technologies here so again we're gonna focus on this and um, that should do it for us for now so now i think we can move to the military and the military is gonna be something that will require quite a lot of talk so bear with me here you can see that i already organized our army uh, we are starting with a fairly large army, which represents uh, the reality. It's not as big as German army is. I think they have about twice of our size. Can we see here? Yeah, they got 127 divisions. Yeah, we got 66. Most of which are Landwehr division. We got some Ersatz division, some Hussars, and some Gebirgsjäger. Now, uh, I went um, as historical here as possible. It was mentioned in the introduction that the Hungarian army was actually split into three... Uh, well, speaking about the army, not, not the military. Let's speak about the army only. The army in Austria-Hungary actually had three huge distinction or distinctive branches that were, and that's very important, not organized into one army. There was the... Kaiserlich und Königlich Army, the KUK Army, which was the overall army of Austria-Hungary. But there was also a special Hungarian army called Hunved, I think. Uh, yeah, Hunved. And there was also an Austrian special army, which was called Landwehr. So the, the thing that you need to realize is that uh, the Austrian army was under the direct command of Vienna and the Hungarian army was under the direct control of the parliament in Budapest. Which means that these two were greatly funded, got a lot of money, a lot of supplies. And the Austro-Hungarian army, the big one that was supposed to be like the general one, got scraps. So historically... You know, once once the war broke out, they were all integrated and worked together. But it was kind of funny that, uh, you know, you can see the politics of uh, the dual monarchy where there were actually three distinct uh, armies and the, the local ones, the ones that were under direct command of the two cities. Uh, and I mean, you know, I, I say cities, but I mean the establishment were the benefic benefiting one. They were the good ones, while the overall army was the one that suffered. And so I tried to um, go as historical with that as possible. So we have the Royal Landwehr here that will take defense of this territory. Uh, we have it split around the entirety of the nation, so there will be a lot of movement in the beginning. There are seven divisions in the Royal Landwehr. Then we have the Hungarian Landwehr, which is the Hunved. Uh, Hunved actually means motherland, I think. So they will defend the core territory that... Um, you know, is Slovakia and Hungary. And then we have the uh, Kaiserlich Königlich Army, which is split into the first uh, KUK Army and the second KUK Army. I actually am surprised how many uh, divisions there are uh, dedicated to this. I think that the ratio should be uh, more towards the Royal Wandwehr and Hungarian Wandwehr. Uh, but still, you know, that's, that's what we have to to work with here. So these units will defend the borders, you know, making sure that we have uh, the borders covered, while the Royal Wandwehr and Hungarian Wandwehr is going to defend uh, the respective territories. Now we also have the uh, third KUK Gebirgs army, which uh, I am going to put on the border with um, Serbia once we actually uh, annex uh, our puppet Bosnia. Okay, so uh, you can see that uh, 
we didn't have enough generals for everything, which is also why the Royal Wanwer and Hungarian Wanwer are um, under the one command of Army Group 1. I'm going to actually split this and get another Field Marshal for uh, the Hungarian Wanwer. But uh, for now, we don't have enough commanders. We also have an army here called Landsturm. I actually had to Google that because I wasn't sure who these are. And those were reserve uh, reserve units. You can see it also on their template, uh, which were, you know, manned by uh, manned by men of the age of 35 to 55, I believe, that were still part of the army, but were not like the front unit. Now, these Landsturmbrigaden were eventually incorporated uh, into the regular army once the war broke out, so they stopped uh, serving as reservists. But for now, you know, I, I thought that we would start with them, and they're going to defend the central territory that are not uh, part of uh, the area that's going to be defended by Royal and Hungarian Landwehr. So that's what I did with the army here. Now, we will need to enact a huge military reform. Um, I expect that we're going to be doing it somewhere 1912, 1913, uh, which is going to mean uh, we have the Landwehr division here, which is going to be our main front uh, infantry that's going to defend uh, our borders against the Russians and other neighboring nations. Now, it's going to require us to give them the logistic companies and uh, field hospitals, but I would also like to give them some regular artillery if we're going to be able to, because while they have a decent defense, if they come onto heavy attack, they will require um, the cover of artillery so that they can cause more casualties to the incoming enemy. So I envision them being something like this in the end, but you can see that's going to require us <laughs> to give them 4,320 artillery pieces. So this is this is the end game, basically. We're not going to be able to do it at any point uh, now. Also, we would need 2,000 support equipment and for the transport vehicles, uh, which means 2,000 and 1,200 uh, units respectively of transport and support equipment. Jesus Christ. Well, one can dream, but one Wehr division, uh, this is going to be one Wehr division, say, 1916, I guess, by the time we might start doing that. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, but this is this is going to be what I want to do with the front divisions. All of our Ersatz divisions, which are the, what are they called? The Landsturm divisions, are going to be eventually turned into one Wehr division. That's going to be the first step of our uh, of our reform. I'd also like to make these slightly stronger. I'd like to have at least uh, 24 in each of these armies and turn the Landsturm into a third army that's going to have also 24 divisions, if we can do that. And those will be used uh, to defend against um, Russia, against um, well, actually, the, the the two armies, the first and second one, will probably be uh, defending against uh, Russia, while the third army is going to be defending against Serbia, and maybe later against Italy. We'll see how that's going to go. Now, one thing, though, that I really want to speak about here is that we're going to uh, start working on the Stostrupen divisions, which is a theoretical division that we do not have at this point. But these guys are not going to be Fioradico at all. These guys are going to be our heavy hitters. In the first step, they are going to have this. They're going to have um, 54 pieces of heavy artillery, giving them extra soft attack and uh, HP. Unfortunately, their breakthrough is going to be awful. But with this kind of heavy attack, they might be able to actually break through and de decimate the enemies that they will attack. I think they might also get regular artillery like this uh, in the beginning, which I think would be good. Now, we're going to see how much of uh, these we can field. I would be happy with, say, four units at the beginning of the war, because I'm also considering giving them um, armored cars like so. And the armored cars would be there simply for the increase in soft attack and for the increases in breakthrough. Because none of these actually give you a huge boost to breakthrough. Actually, I don't think that... Okay, you give three. Uh, but the armored cars at this point give six. And they will give us even more. And by that I mean eight once uh, we have these you know, upgraded. 
The issue here is that uh, to get to these numbers, we will need 240 armored cars for one division. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. The first step we're going to go with is this. And we're going to see how well we are able to supply these units. Eventually, I can just give them... Uh, give them the armored cars, you know, then give them another one. The amount of cars that's needed for these divisions is just insane, but the boost to breakthrough, I think, is worth it. If we ever get to tanks, I'm gonna probably create a separate template that that's gonna deal with this, but... You know, we shall see. So these units are going to be the main ones. I'd also like to train more Gebirgsieg uh, divisions that are gonna be fighting against... Um, Italy in the mountains here. So getting more mountain... I don't know how many we could train here. Okay, we get three divisions and we could add additional nine. So I could train two more divisions and if we could give them some artillery, their defense is going to be pretty good, especially in the mountains. So they should be able to easily defend against any oncoming attack. Though their defense is not great. But if we give them also support artillery and few hospitals, they could probably work well. I'd rather have more of these because of the mount mountainous area where we are going to fight with the Italians rather than having less of them. So that's the thing. Okay, so uh, that covers the army now to the production uh, of uh, military equipment. You can see that we are starting with infantry equipment and support equipment on four factories. Uh, field artillery is on two out of four and horse-drawn vehicles are at two. That's because if I want to import rubber, I'd rather use two of those than just one. So I put two factories on that to make sure. So the next two military factories are going to go to field artillery and then we're going to add one to all trains and then we are going to start working on the siege artillery. We'll need tons of uh, factories working on that because these cost 12.5 while well, for example infantry equipment cost 0.24 and even the regular field artillery costs 2.4. So these give you the biggest boost uh, but they are extremely expensive. I think they're way... Wait... How many do we need? Yeah, armored card is here. And they cost four. So the cost of one piece of siege artillery, you can get three cars, basically. And if we wanted to add these, you need how many? Okay, that's roughly fair. You need, say, 20 heavy artillery and three times more armored cars. So it's... It's rig you know, it's the same same ratio. These guys gives eleven defense, free breakthrough, but twenty six soft attack and two hard attack. And you guys give two point eight defense, so that is comparable. But you give six breakthrough, which is uh, your strength, and nine soft attack. Yeah, so it would be good to have, you know, both of these. Rather to have a few divisions than have more, because we have well, we have the main armies that are going to. Uh, hold the line, we'll use these divisions to break through to Belgrade and other areas and take these southern territories. We must make sure that the Ottoman Empire doesn't have to fight here and they can dedicate all of their troops into the fight with uh, Great Britain. Hopefully we're not going to have such a nightmarish scenario as we had before. Okay, and last topic that I would like to cover here is the Navy. Well, the Navy, the Navy, the Navy. As I mentioned, we have only two dockyards, which is just abysmal. Uh, we have only a couple of ships scheduled. Uh, they are actually, the first pre dreadnought is going to be finished uh, in a couple of months, so that's good. The second one is going to be done in a couple of years, though, so that's horrifying. And then we have one uh, second pre dreadnought here of the second class and White Cruiser 1. Now, our Navy in fact, is actually pretty sizable. Uh, they are way bigger than whatever, whatever we had as uh, Sweden. And I think if we play our cards well, we can and should be able to sink the Italian Navy. We probably won't be able to face the Royal Navy, but I doubt they would go this deep. So let's hope it's going to work. We got 11 heavy dreadnought ships. Most of these are actual pre-dreadnoughts too. So they are great, but the issue is they require extensive upgrades immediately. So we could greatly upgrade these right off the bat. 
uh, if you just check it like this we don't need we could put secondary batteries here instead and more heavy batteries so this alone would cost us just 4231 in refit cost but this this ship would become a beast but again like this is oh and we're not even done here i think that yeah we can boost you by adding additional ones so all of our ships of the heavy type require extensive refits right off the bat. Same thing is for the heavy cruisers that we have, which are of the armored cruiser 1 and 2 type, which again lack a number of modules. We could add torpedo launchers here, we could add uh, rapid fire light cruiser batteries or heavy cruiser batteries, um, which might be even better if we added heavy. Yeah, we look at that bonuses. And upgrade the medium batteries here giving them cruiser armor so we can refit a ton of these ships but a that's gonna cost us a ton of experience uh, it's gonna cost us a ton of um, uh, dockyards to, to make these refits and it's gonna be a long-term project so while we have a lot of ships to start with I don't think that for quite some time we will see more production here we're of course gonna finish these ships but then we're gonna have to refit them and make sure that they are capable of fighting rather than you know being uh, being whatever they are actually I haven't put in some admirals so you have fleet coordination of 6 and naval hit chance of 15 positioning damage Okay, and it's the same. Okay. Oh, you guys are all the same. What well, you have instead of positioning. Oh, what's your. Oh, you don't have the skills. Okay. So you have positioning and positioning. So we can put uh, Anton House in command of the first Navy. And also, we have a couple of submarines, which, you know, are not anything to, to write home about. But it's six submarines. Uh, they again lack some torpedo tubes, but. You know, not much that we can we can complain about there. So the thing is that we will just need to upgrade the dockyards, which is why I put such a heavy emphasis on starting the upgrades uh, and building the dockyards as soon as possible. We're going to have to see how many dockyards we're going to need. And we'll also need to make sure uh, that we get these, uh, what are they called, dockyard expansions? Yeah, as fast as possible. They will each give us two then four, so we can get by 1913. We will have uh, four from this, two from construction, and two what we have. So we'll uh, increase our capacity four times. And in 1915, there's two extra. So yeah, I think that 10 in 1915 should be enough. We might get even more if we need to get more, but uh, I don't want to overdo it because you know there's no need for such an extensive, uh, extensive but maybe 10 is not enough maybe we'll need like 20 and I'll, I'll just have to change my plans completely but yeah the refits and everything will be very important now we do have a lot of oil so I don't have a problem with putting our navies immediately on uh, military exercises we'll see how quickly we drain that oil away uh, but the navy experience is gonna start jumping up which is good and we'll start by refitting the destroyers as we do because those are uh, really important for coverage. I'm gonna add more torpedo launchers on them. I don't think we'll need that many. Actually, we could completely refit you to just torpedo launchers and have dedicated special sub, uh, sub hunters. On the other hand, these are gonna be fleet and we they might send some submarines against us, so. Most of you guys need the torpedo tubes, and they can get better white batteries right off the bat, so yeah, this is gonna be it. Okay, so I think that we've covered everything. I think that we've covered the military, we've covered the uh, production, we've covered the research. Yeah, uh, long episode, long episode, but I explained my plans, I hope, in depth. And in the next episode, we are going to start playing. Yeah, so not much to say to that. Other than hope you enjoyed this descriptive part and in the next episode we are going to unpause it and start dealing with the actual stuff. 
And while Austria-Hungary is not uh, the strongest nation, I believe that we can be a pretty good help to German Empire, especially because we are getting 1.45 million in manpower right now with the limited conscription. And one thing that I haven't mentioned, so I'm gonna put it as an ending thing here. Militarism gives us additional 5%. Military youth gives us additional 2%. And there are other things that I think Let's see, recruitable, is there anything else? Yeah, we have additional recruitable population here. So that is pretty good. Anything else here that uh, damage to garrison's population? Free elections, that's not gonna help. Reign of Terror, oh my god. Manpower, extra manpower. Yeah, okay, so, okay, but you know, with just the, what is it, um, service by requirement, we jump from 1.45 million to four times that, and with the militarism, that's additional 5%, and military youth, that's two. So from 2.5%, we go to 17%. Uh, which means we are going to get somewhere to like 8 million eligible uh, people. And if we eventually get to extensive conscription, we are going to be golden. Uh, sorry, not uh, extensive, but all that will serve that would be like 15, 16 million just with us. And that's without the population growth. You know, we get uh, every month additional 1.65 thousand. Plus, we are hopefully going to conquer large amounts of... Uh, you know, uh, of the Balkans and of Russia. So let's hope, let us hope for that. So see you in the next episode.